What's up folks, Captain Blade J52 here, and for this video we're going to be taking a look at an older ship that has gotten quite a bit of flack since day one, and this is the T5U Advanced Obelisk Carrier, and a lot of folks give this ship flack because of the mission Sphere of Influence, where you have to fly the pre-constructed version of the vessel as part of the mission, which definitely does not do the ship justice in my opinion at all. And because of that mission, a lot of folks judge the ship, and especially the low-buy version, very unfairly. And because of that, they missed out on a very nice carrier. Now, if you're someone that appreciates carriers, you'll appreciate this one in my personal opinion. Not to mention, it also gives an often overlooked tool for tanks in the form of its console, which we're going to take a look at very shortly. Now this is one of the engineering carrier line of vessels. There's only a select few within the game. I think there's... I'm pretty sure there's two of them at the moment. For some reason I about want to think there's three. I'm sure somebody will correct me in the comments down below on this stuff. But um, there's the obelisk for sure. And then I think the other one is the Vorgon carrier. That's also an engineering variant. Now, engineering carrier basically means it has a heavy focus on engineering, as you can see from the bridge officer setup down here. It is uh, kind of where it gets that name. Now, as far as um, the ship itself goes, I will definitely say it's an interesting one so far. It performed a little better than what I was expecting. I was actually expecting it to do not quite as good on paper but it actually surprised me. I have to say it actually did kind of surprise me with some stuff. Whenever we started getting into it, started testing it, that sort of thing. Now let's go ahead and get into our setup. Now one thing I am going to point out is I'm actually using my Jim Hadar character for this because he had access to more traits, more abilities, things that I could potentially use for a carrier and that I might want to use for a carrier, so I'm using him for this instead of my regular main. So that is one thing I did want to mention, and there's actually a note I'm going to make for you guys when we get to the traits section of the video as to something where I screwed up on, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Now as far as the mastery of the ship goes, you can see here it gets the quick deployment, it reduces the recharge time of pets, lets you launch them faster, gives them a rank up. You get armored hull for extra hull. The enhanced hull plating for energy and radiation damage resistance. And then finally the advanced shield systems for some extra shield HP. Which is kind of nice. Now for this particular vessel it is a 3-3 layout, meaning it has three weapons in the front, three weapons in the back. Now, one thing I'm sure some folks are going to notice right away is I'm not using all beam arrays for this. There is actually a torpedo on the build, and some folks may be wondering, well, why aren't you using all beam arrays on a ship like that? Well, there's actually a reason for that. We're going to get into that when we discuss traits and that sort of thing. But let's go ahead and take a look at our equipment, and we will dive into this. Now, first up, we have our anti-proton matter conversion beam. This is an old uh, beam array from one of the crystalline events that we had. If you were lucky enough to get it from the event, I believe this is in the MUDS market store now, if I'm not mistaken. And you can get it and the dual cannons from there. So what is so special about this one is there's potentially two things you can do with it is you can debuff their energy damage resistance which could stack up to five times for a pretty hefty debuff and the resistance rating debuff is doubled for anti-proton damage so yeah you're gonna debuff them a lot harder for anti-proton and then the other benefit is that it can actually proc a heal on the ship now it's showing 385.5 hit points every second for 10 seconds for me. Now your number might be a little higher, might be a little bit lower. If that's the case, don't freak out. That can happen. But basically a nice little tanking beam in my opinion. Next we have our Crystalline Energy Torpedo. 
Now this is our uh, energy torpedo that we have from uh, an even older crystalline event. You can now get these out of the Phoenix boxes. And what's so special about the energy torpedoes, for those that may not be familiar with them, is basically it looks like a torpedo, it fires like a torpedo, it acts like a torpedo, but it does energy damage instead of kinetic. So, whereas normal torpedoes would do kinetic damage, this one does anti-proton and can basically double dip into things that benefit your torpedoes and things that also buff your anti-protons within reason and a few exceptions, of course. So, energy torpedoes can be controversial for some people, but um, I wanted to go ahead and use it with this particular build. Now, we also have two of these on the ship. We have one in the front, one in the back, which is a crafted anti-proton beam array with a pin modifier. The only way you're going to get the pin mod is if it is from a crafted beam. So that is something to keep in mind. We have one here and then one here. Now for the aft weapons, we have a Voth anti-proton beam. And what is so special about the Voth beam is it's going to debuff the enemy outgoing damage. So that's a lot less damage you're going to be taking up front, which is very nice to have. Then we also have a Herald Anti-Proton Beam, and whenever it procs, it gives you some Category 2 Energy Damage Bonus for 20 seconds, can stack up to 3 times. So if you get it procking good, that's potentially up to 21% bonus energy weapon damage. Now, the proc rates on a lot of these weapons aren't as great since the Season 13 rebalance, but it still gets the job done. It's still worth having, in my opinion, for when it does proc, and is always very nice. And then, of course, we have our extra crafted beam there. So that's what we have for our weapons. Now, let's go ahead and look at our shields, engines, deflector, and warp core, which is our trusted Kobali set. I wanted to go with that on this particular vessel because I thought it played nicely with you know the engineering theme of the ship, plus... I wasn't really sure how this one was going to perform for me because I hadn't really used an obelisk in quite a while and I wanted to make sure all my bases were covered. Now for the Kobali set, I'm going to move through this quickly because we feature it a lot here on the channel. We've got our Resol mod, which uh, reduces uh, energy damage to shields by 10%. So no matter what kind of energy damage we come up against, we're going to have some bit of damage reduction to it, which is very, very nice. For our impulse engines, they're hyper-impulse engines, meaning they do a little bit better the higher your engine power is, but uh, can still be very nice even at the lower power levels. Now, the strength to these engines is they give you anywhere from a 3% to a 10.5% uh, recharge time reduction on hull and shield healing bridge officer abilities and that benefit will increase as your engine power level increases so that is cooldown reduction that you're basically getting for free just by having these on the ship which uh, will let you use your heals a lot more often otherwise aside from that they're basically generic uh, impulse engines then you have your Kobali deflector. This is uh, your primary deflector. It's got some nice benefits to hull and shield restoration, some benefits to hull and shield capacity, a little bit of control expertise. Now, I'm of the opinion that most primary deflectors are purely stat sticks. What you see is what you get. This one is, you know, the Kobali deflector is no exception to that rule. The strength to the Kobali deflector is the healing benefits it gives you, but also the fact that it's tied to the Kobali 4-piece. We're going to take a look at our set bonuses in just a minute or two here. Then we have our Kobali Field Stabilizing Core. Now, the Field Stabilizing Core itself is kind of a generic Field Stabilizing Core for the regular benefits that it gives, but the big deal here is the Shield Capacitor. Now it's a 5 kilometer heal whenever you pop it, so it can potentially restore your shields and that of allied uh, players nearby. 
It's uh, showing me a 9354.5 shield regeneration to nearby allies. Gives a bit of shield power to uh, you and allies for 20 seconds. Can also repair disabled shields of nearby allies and is on a four minute recharge. So that's the capacitor for the warp core itself, which is very nice. Depending on your shield capacity and other bonuses, I have seen this completely restore somebody's shields just by popping it. So it's gonna depend on what kind of healing you've got, your shield capacity, and some factors like that, but it can indeed happen. Now we're gonna take a look at the set bonuses and everything once we've looked at all of our equipment and such. Now moving on to our devices. You have four device slots for this particular vessel. Now I like to think of devices as personal preference. There is no right or wrong answer to what devices to use, but um, the ones I have on here are the Temporal Negotiator. It cuts your bridge officer cooldowns in half for the duration it's active. You have your Red Matter Capacitor from uh, if you were somebody that had it from the start of the game for one of those old red matter capacitor codes now you can get it from the phoenix boxes for i believe it's a very rare token is what it takes to get one of these and it's going to grant 25 to all of your power levels so up to 100 power total is what you're going to get from this device just by using it which is very very nice to have then you have your energy amplifier batteries which are crafted from the beams R&D school and it's going to give you a 20 percent bonus energy weapon damage for 20 seconds so a very hefty cat 2 bonus category 2 basically meaning it buffs everything whereas category 1 in a nutshell only buffs your base values I'm sure somebody else can explain that in a little bit greater detail but that's the basic summarization now some other devices you might consider are the subspace field modulator, uh, deuterium surplus, Geminite hardpoints. It really just depends on what you personally think you need. Again, there is no right or wrong answer. You can combo them up as you need to. So that's just my take on devices. Now for our console layout, we have five engineering, three science, three tactical, and then two hangar bays. Now for our hangar bays, we have two sets of the Elite Obelisk Swarmers. You can see they give um, focused anti-proton arrays, some transphasic torps, some Elite Defense arrays, and beam, beam Array Overload 3. It should just be, I think that's a tooltip error. I think they're just calling that Beam Overload now. But anyway, in case you guys are wondering what they look like, I'm going to try to zoom in on one of these here. So... If you've been to the Dyson Sphere ground, you've seen these little farts flying around in there. This is basically what you're la uh, launching out of the ship, is these little things right here. Again, I don't know how well you guys can see that on camera. Hopefully you can. But yeah, that's what you're getting is some versions of these. So that's the Swarmer pets that you have. Now, I will say they're not my favorite hangar pet ever. I have some other pets that uh, come to mind before these, but as far as pets that will get the job done, these will definitely get the job done, so I can't really complain about them too much. Now for tactical consoles, these are really quick and easy to explain. These are our vulnerability exploiters. They give us some Cat 1 anti-proton boosting, but they also give us a nice chunk of critical severity, roughly shy of 10% per console. It's 9.8% critical severity, so very nice benefits there. We're going to look at our science consoles now. Now for our science consoles, we have our Temporal Disentanglement Suite. Now what is so special about this console is it's going to give a little bit of aux power. It's going to give a very nice boost to our shield capacity, 26.2% capacity boost, and anywhere from a 0 to 2.5% critical chance and 10% critical severity based on our aux power so we're gonna get a fairly decent boost off of that to crit chance and severity and then we're gonna get a 3% shield resistance buff so that's less damage our shields are gonna take 
Now, I definitely recommend this console. It's got some nice benefits uh, for offense and defense ability. Next, we have our ablative hazard shielding, which comes off of the Arbiter and similar types of uh, KDF and Romulan ships, which I believe is the Moragu for the Romulans and... I cannot remember the name of the KDF version of the ship. But... Uh, Anyway, whenever they unbound this and took it off of the Arbiter type of ships, this gave tanks another thing that we can add to our toolkit of abilities. Now, passively, it gives a bit of shield resistance and improves shield regeneration rate by 10%, so that's very nice. And whenever you use it, it gives a very nice secondary shield that absorbs a fair amount of damage. And whenever the secondary shield is depleted, it gives a pretty massive heal to your hull as well as a nice bit applied to your shields. So it gives you a secondary shield that's going to absorb damage. Once that fails, it pops a very big heal on top of you. And this effect lasts for 45 seconds for the secondary shield. Then we have our tachyokinetic converter is um, a staple console we use a lot here. It gives uh, some control expertise, a very nice chunk of flight turn rate, which is 40%. It gives 1.3% critical chance and 13.1% critical severity. Now, this is one of our low buy consoles that uh, I like to use as one of our staples. It's basically a RCS console and an assimilated module from the Omega reputation slammed into one thing. So if an RCS console for turn rate and the Omega assimilated module were to have a baby, this thing would be it. This is what it would come out as. So if you're able to pick up a tachyokinetic converter, I highly recommend it, if nothing else but for the utility that it gives. But getting into our engineering consoles. Now, a lot of you are probably going to recognize our regenerative integrity field from the SAMSAR. It's going to give a nice bit of hull healing. It's going to give a nice burst heal up front, which increases as our HP decreases. And then you receive 100% of your directed energy damage as healing for 10 seconds. And uh, I do need to point this out that tooltip is slightly misleading because there is a minimum floor that it can heal you for and a maximum ceiling that it can heal you for. So the minimum amount of hull that it's going to restore is 558.5 every proc. The maximum hull it's going to restore is 4467.9. Now when you do the math, this can proc up to five times a second and it can and it's going to run for up to 10 seconds. So you get 10 seconds at five triggers a second and assuming you get the maximum heal every time and the maximum amount of triggers per second you're looking at a little over six hundred thousand points of healing off of this console now if somebody wants to work out the exact math I'm sure they'll do that maybe post that in uh, the comments down below But this is a very potent console even in today's game I know a lot of people use it and pretty much as long as the effect is going and as long as you are shooting you will be healing. So that is something to keep in mind. Next is our protomatter field projector from the Lucari ship, otherwise known as the Lucari Dorito. This is the little triangular Lucari ship. I cannot remember the class name off the top of my head. And it gives a bit of hull and shield restoration as a passive. And then it gives you a player-based AOE hull regen and shield regen. And while it's active, you get 392.3% shield regeneration and 430% hull regeneration. Now, one thing I am going to mention is the shield restoration and hull restoration skills boost those percentages. So if your numbers are a bit different from mine, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower, don't freak out, that can happen. Because I highly doubt we all have the exact same amount of uh, hull and shield restoration. But essentially what this does is it latches on to the hull regeneration rate and shield regeneration rate and buffs them significantly for each thing. Now I have seen in some defend the objective type scenarios where people have restored the objective 
from nearly dead, if not outright, back to full just by using this console. And especially if there's more than one of them there. So, very potent console, highly recommended if you can get your hands on it. And if you're missing some of these consoles that we're going over, again, folks, don't hesitate to let me know. We can try to make some adjustments in the meantime until you can get a hold of some of these, but I did kind of want to mention that. Now, I have a conductive RCS accelerator on here because I ran into some issues in testing where I thought I wanted to have a little bit more turn rate on here. And um, now the mod that I have on here is a Drain X, just because that's what I had laying around on Holodeck. Now, I had experimented with slapping the assimilated module on here if I didn't think I need the turn rate. That's going to be up to you guys as to which one you think you're going to need. This is what I found a good bit of success with is uh, this. Now, our conductive RCS accelerators give us a nice chunk of turn rate, but also it applies the conductive accelerator for 15 seconds, which is a nice chunk of shield resistance, some extra turn rate, and can occur once every 30 seconds. Next, we have our bioneural infusion circuits, which is the most potent console in the game for crit severity off of a single bonus at the moment. Still at the time of filming this, you get 26.2% critical severity off of one console. And then it does give you some whole capacity and control expertise as well. So this is pretty much a staple console in a lot of builds. Now, the last thing we have is our reactive anti-proton cascade emitter. Good luck saying that ten times fast. Now, this is the console that comes with the obelisk itself. And a lot of people overlook this console, especially some of the tanks, which actually surprised me. Now, for this particular console, it is actually a taunt, which is very good for tanks, because that gives us something that we can use aside from just the one that's built into the strategist uh, skill tree. So, it's an AoE taunt. It taunts the target and up to four other targets within five kilometers, forcing these targets to attack your ship for 20 seconds. It's a plus 100 energy damage resistance rating for 20 seconds, 50% shield resistance for 20 seconds, and then to self, after 10 seconds, it grants reactive anti-proton cascade for 10 seconds, which reflects energy damage back at the attacker for 200% of the incoming damage up to four times per second, and is on a one-minute recharge. So, essentially, this functions as an AoE taunt and defensive type of console. Now, it's not going to be the greatest as far as the damage reflection goes. I'm going to go ahead and float that out there for you guys. But, it does add an extra taunt to your toolkit as a tank, which is very nice to have because we don't really have that many dedicated taunts in STO like you do in other games like World of Warcraft where tanks can taunt up to one target every six seconds. You just switch, taunt, switch, taunt, switch, taunt, switch, taunt, and then they have some other AoE based taunts that they can use as well. We don't really have that here in Stowe. So you gotta kind of kinda I guess it's the word I'm looking for. You gotta kinda balance out your toolkits, I guess if that makes any bit of sense. And you want to use your taunts sparingly. Now as far as our skill tree goes, let's go ahead and... whoops, actually almost forgot our set bonuses. So we'll take a look at our skill tree in just a second. I was getting a little ahead of myself there. So for our set bonuses, let's look at our Kubali. Now for the two-piece, it gives some hull regeneration that increases as HP decreases. You also get the reactive nanite screen when you're at or below 25% and you get smacked. It gives you some temporary hit points for 15 seconds that uh, can occur once every two minutes. Now the real strength of the Kobali set is in the four piece bonus that it gives you. Now for this particular bonus, it's a five kilometer sphere, two minute recharge, and whenever you're getting hit, it says to you and nearby allies for 15 seconds, you gain 20% of incoming damage is healing maximum 20 times per second it can proc always heals between 100 and 20 thousand points of HP so minimum you're gonna get per proc is 100 maximum you're, you're gonna get is 20,000 
So if you're taking damage, this is going to be proccing to heal you. Now, whenever you do the math, that's about 20 times a second that you can get it, assuming you're getting all of the procs, all 20 procs a second for the maximum proc. I worked the math out one day, and I think this came out to a little over 3 million points of healing. It was some ridiculously high number like that. That, Like I say, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but um, that's kind of what you can do with it there. So it ended up being several million points of healing. So it's going to take a lot to burst through that, and especially if you're using the regenerative integrity field on top of that and the Lucari Dorito console. If, God forbid, you're in a situation where you need to pop all three, yeah. If they can bust through that, then they've earned it at that point, in my opinion. But, so. anyways, one thing I will say, and this is a little addendum I always give when it comes to the Kobali set. In my personal opinion, if you cannot use the four-piece Kobali, if you're not going to use all four pieces, then don't use the set. The reason I'm going to say that is because the two-piece and the three-piece, while they're nice, they're not necessarily the strongest things out there. And you're going to get more mileage out of something like Soul Defense if you can't use all four pieces of the Kobali set. So there are other options out there, including the four-piece Lucari, which can rival the Kobali set in terms of healing, whereas Kobali is more bursty, the uh, Lucari set is more heal over time type of stuff. Now for our... Uh, let's see, there was one more set bonus I wanted to look at. I'm having a bit of a brain fart here. Let's see, nope. Nope, it's not that one. Let's see, I want to think there was... Hmm. Apparently not. Okay, so now we can officially move on to our skills and stuff. Now for our skills, it's pretty much the standard skill setup that I use here on the channel. And you guys can see the skill retrain bug, uh, bug is back on triple at the moment. Now this is the one I typically recommend to people quite a bit. I actually have this particular build in my Tanking 101 series here on the channel. I'm kind of scrolling through really quick for folks that want to see it. But um, one thing I have considered doing for this particular character is moving the two points out of EPG into like coordination protocols and stuff for his hangar pets. But um, that's really up to each individual person. Now, as far as his primary and secondary specs, he's using the Intel primary at the moment, Strategist secondary. Now. I always recommend Strategist Secondary at least to tanks in space because of the taunt that you get. Then the other ones that you have are perhaps maybe Miracle Worker. Now this guy doesn't really have his built up that much. But as far as to your primary spec, I would say either Intel or Miracle Worker for a tank. If you think you can get by without the extra healing, I would say maybe go for Intel, focus on your knockdown power. If you think you need the extra healing and benefits, then go for Miracle Worker. There is no right or wrong answer to that. Now getting into our traits. Now this is one thing where I do need to make a note for you guys. Now I've corrected it for this part of the video here. Is One of the traits we have is Wing Commander. Now that was supposed to have been on here and this is where I screwed up. Now, whenever we were doing the Japori and Beta Thoradar runs, we actually had the projectile training on here in place of this. This is because I changed some stuff around on Holodeck, and I didn't think to change it back whenever, uh, whenever I copied this guy over, so he was supposed to have had Wing Commander for what he was doing for this. So keep in mind the damage numbers you're going to see are a little bit skewed because of that, but I don't think it did enough to actually hurt it that much. But that is something I did want to throw out there for you guys. Now as far as his uh, space traits go, we have a good day to die because he's a tactical officer. This lets, uh, this lets us use uh, go down fighting at any hull capacity. Beam Barrage for our R&D crafting trait. This is... Um, 
We always like to assume that we've leveled at least one of our R&D crafting schools. In this case, we've chosen beams. Superior beam training for the free beam damage that it gives. Context is for kings. Either they give us some damage resistance or some bonus damage to slap them with, depending on whether or not we've been shot. So either way, we win. Elusive for free defensive value, making our ship harder to hit. Fleet coordinator for free damage. The last ditch effort which is going to be a damage resistance while go down fighting is active then what we were supposed to have which is our wing commander which is going to let us rank up our hangar pets a lot faster and then finally our Terran target systems for a free 15 percent severity and whenever we get critically hit we reduce our speed by 10 percent for five seconds maximum once every 15 seconds so slight little downside there which kind of expected with that then for our starship traits, we have entwined tactical matrices from the Kagarin. When we activate torpedo spread, we get a free fire at will one and scatter volley to self. When activating fire at will or scatter volley, we get a free torpedo spread one. Now this is why I have the torpedo on the ships to take advantage of that torp spread a little bit more. And I ran into some situations where and this is why I've started moving towards entwined matrices. As um, some folks may be wondering, I ran into some situations where redirecting arrays was good, but it wasn't enough anymore for what I was doing. And I needed something that could potentially give me more uptime, give me more to work with as a tank. So I swapped over to ma uh, entwined tactical matrices, which gives me greater uptime and greater control over what I'm doing there. Next we have History Will Remember, which all of these benefits can stack up to 30 times. Whenever they hit the maximum of 30 stacks, you're going to get 30% all damage, 30% hull regen, 30% maximum hull, and up to 300% threat generation. Next we have The Honored Dead, which uh, as it's proccing, as it's building up, you're essentially going to be getting close to 10% across the board resistance out of this trait, which is very nice. Next we have our attack pattern Delta Prime, which uh, in addition to the normal effects of our attack pattern Delta, we're going to get 1.5% critical chance and 3.75% severity for 5 seconds on each hit, which stacks up to 10 times. So this is potentially worth up to 15% critical chance and 37.5% severity. Next we have our emergency weapon cycle which is going to be a minus 50% weapon power cost and 20% firing cycle haste for energy weapons for 30 seconds. So more knockdown power which is always nice. Now for this particular character we're using precision for the free critical hit chance the magnified firepower for the static cat 2 boosting that it gives. We're using ox power offensive, which is bonus damage and accuracy based on ox power. We're using advanced target systems for the free severity and energy refrequencer for the bits of healing that it's going to give us. Now, it's going to heal for a percentage of energy damage we're doing. As long as we're shooting, we're going to be healing. And I have seen a lot of cases where energy refrequencer over the course of a run is going to outheal even the regenerative integrity field in similar types of consoles because it's constantly healing. Now, as far as your active reputations go, there is no right or wrong answers, but some of the ones I found good success with are the biomolecular shield generator, a little bit of shield restor or shield regeneration, I almost said restoration, and shield resistance while you're inside the bubble. Anti-time entanglement singularity, nice little AoE. Uh, physical damage kick in the pants and slow to enemies. Quantum Singularity Manipulation, which is going to buff our science stats for the duration. You can pop this first and other type of things, then drop your anti-time on there to get more mileage out of it. And then just as another nice little AoE attack, mainly because I couldn't really think of what else I wanted to slap on here for this guy, is the Refracting Tetrion Cascade. Now, I believe... Do I have his stuff on here? Yeah, I didn't think he needed the deploy sensor interference platform, so I didn't really throw it on there this time. Now we're going to move to our uh, duty officers. We're going to take a look at our bridge officers, 
and uh, that sort of thing. Then we're going to get into our builds. I know I'm kind of running a little bit longer in this section than I wanted to, but let's go ahead and look at our DOFs. Of course, it helps if I go to the right tab. Okay, so for the duty officers on here, I have the sixth uh, slot unlocked. Now, we're using our emergency con duty officer that we can get from our Phoenix boxes now. Activating emergency powered engines reduces the recharge time on evasive maneuvers drastically and can, in a lot of cases, outright reset the ability. Then for our Zmoc, he is going to reduce uh, the recharge time to our attack patterns, beta, delta, and omega by 15%. So very nice to have if you can get one of him or one of the equivalents. Then we have one of our purple duty officers, which is going to increase our critical chance when firing energy weapons up to three stacks and up to 3% critical chance, which is very nice. Then we have three of our Adaku Cons, which is uh, very nice to have. Pretty much you're going to want at least two of these as a tank, in my opinion. I'm using three because I don't have cruiser commands on this ship. The standard usually is, at least for the way I build, is two of them, but there are times when it demands three. And essentially what he does is whenever your attack pattern delta is... Uh, popped, he is going to give you plus 100% threat generation for the 15 seconds. Now that 1.3 seconds thing is actually a tooltip error that's not supposed to be there, but um, he gives you 100% threat generation while he's active. He can stack up to the three times, so that's potentially an extra 300% threat generation you're getting there. So between your threatening stance, your history will remember, that's 600% threat generation there. And then if you're using your Adaku Cons as often as you should, that's an extra 300% threat gen. So 900% threat generation alone just in that. So that's a pretty big deal. Now getting into our bridge officers, and then we're going to move on. Now for our commander engineering station, we have our engineering team, which is going to heal the hull a bit and purge viral matrix abilities. Emergency powered engines, which is a get the heck out of dodge type of thing, and it's going to recharge our evasive maneuvers based off of our duty officer. Emergency powered weapons for extra weapon power, and that's gonna pop our uh, emergency weapon cycle trait and give us greater knockdown power. Reverse shield polarity to recharge our shields based off of incoming damage in a pinch. Very nice little life-saving ability whenever you need it there. Next we have our Lieutenant Commander Science Station for our science team to recharge our shields and purge subnucleonic type effects. Hazard emitters for the heal over time as well as damage reduction that it's going to give and debuff removal such as Borg Plasma Fires. Then we have our gravity well, mainly for the control, which lets us group foes up and control the battlefield a little bit better. For our lieutenant tactical seat, we have a tactical team to redirect our shield facings automatically where they're needed and purge uh, boarding parties. Fire at will to slap everything within range with a beam, which is also one of the abilities that's going to pop our entwined matrices. Then for our Lieutenant Universal, we made this into a tactical seat. We have our torpedo spread, which is going to let us smack uh, several targets with some torpedoes. Also going to pop our entwined matrices. Then we have our attack pattern delta, which is one of the most, if not the most important abilities in your tanking toolkit. It's going to pop your Adaku Cons, your Delta Prime, and some other nice benefits. Now, Delta on its own is going to basically function as a damage reduction kind of leech to, uh, to foes. Essentially, you debuff enemies that shoot you for a minus 30 all damage resistance rating for 5 seconds, which is going to refresh with each hit, and you buff yourself for a plus 30 all damage resistance rating for 15 seconds. 
So, very, very important ability in your tanking toolkit to have there. So, it's pretty much exclusive to tanks because if you're not getting hit, this ability is not going to help you. Then finally, for our Ensign Universal, we have our Transfer Shield Strength, which is going to heal our shields a bit, as well as grant some damage reduction to the shields. So, that's what we have here for our Transfer Shield Strength and our Bridge Officer abilities. Now, again, this probably isn't going to be a DPS setting ship, if that's what you're looking for. It's not going to be a record breaker, but if you're looking for a very fun ship to have, then, especially an older ship, this is something I would recommend people consider. But we're going to go ahead, we're going to take a look at our Beta Thorodar and our Japori runs, and then we're going to come back and break everything down for you guys. But we will be right back. Alrighty, folks. Now that we've uh, pretty much made it through this epic loading screen, we have a resident timber wolf with us. How's it going? So he is doing stuff with, I believe, the is that the miracle worker sovereign? This is a miracle worker. Or what is Connie. that? Honey, doing a nice oddity. Not the constitution. Yeah, doing a nice. Uh, yeah, my constitution glass. Doing a nice, uh, unique build over here. So, I know I kind of surprised you whenever uh, I told you this was going to be the ship for the evening. Yeah. But, uh, it's definitely taken a little bit more getting used to, because it's not the kind of vessel I'm normally used to flying. But, she does what I need to. Yeah, that works. Yeah, with what I'm supposed to be testing right now, this is, uh, this is working rather well. There they are. Why am I not moving? Uh -oh. There we go. So, I have to say, it's been one of the more interesting builds I've done so far. Definitely a little, uh, I know you and I were kind of talking about this when we were doing the theory crafting. Yeah. I'm definitely noticing I'm having to play my fall cycles just a little bit more aggressively, I guess would be the proper terminology here. Just saying, I found. I think I found something that modified just right is going to work great on holodeck. Without giving away details to your your side before uh, I release it. Okay. Okay. I have to test it, of course, in the ISE, but I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. That's good. See, so 
I'm definitely definitely not used to only having six weapons on the ship. Relatively one, smooth. That's smooth, a little bit slower perhaps than what we might normally do, but overall not bad, not bad. Alright folks, so we're gonna take a minute. We're going to warp out of here, we're gonna head over to our Chapori run, and our ship held up rather well, but we're gonna see how well it can actually keep the threat. Of course, he's doing his testing for his own video, because we wanted to get some of his stuff done as well, combo recordings. You can see he's doing a nice tanking test of that old T5, what is it, obelisk carrier? This is the advanced obelisk, specifically the low-buy version. So he's doing that, he's doing a video on that, and that's going to be fun, it's going to be amazing. And let's get this party started. Let's see what kind of firing cycle haste we can get done over here. Now, I have no clue I what this is going to do. Honestly, this is something I used to actually test a lot. I used to do firing cycle haste builds when this first came out because I always thought exceed rate limits was a good power. You know, just the sheer amount of shots per cycle that you could get off of this power I mean, it felt great. It felt useful. This was at a time, of course, before beam fire at will was actually a good power. So being able to fire as many shots as I, I was doing felt really good. But now it feels even better. No idea how well this is going to do, though, as I take threat from Blade. This is not good. This is not good. I threw down some stuff. Oh, it's okay. I'm just doing my Alpha Strike here. Now, I have noticed one thing, and this is going to be something for your guys, is that with this ship, I am having to play a bit more aggressively than I'm used to, so... Probably going to be a couple of hiccups along the way. That's here. fine. I'm just going to need you to get aggressive over there in that direction. As I activate a mega firing cycle haste, and I can stack about 200%. Which, I might have gone over this in the beginning of the video, but I'm going to go over it again here. So, what you're witnessing is, if everything stacks right, and it's not going to really stack as well as it could, comparative to an ISE, where I can just really park, and I've got heavy targets so I can actually survive this. With the math, if there's no diminishing returns for this build on firing cycle haste in the game, you're looking at the potential of over 440% firing cycle haste. Just the way I've built the ship. There is the potential for more. There are additional powers that can give me even more firing cycle haste that I haven't even used. They're mostly starship traits. Or, you know, there's one set, the Trilithium set, I believe I mentioned early on, where I could eke out a little bit more, maybe even get close to 500%. Firing cycle ice, which is an asinine number, to be perfectly honest. Wee. <laughs> huh? 
I say we? <laughs> 500%, good lord, I'm man. just saying, there is that potential. Like I said, I'm at 440, and I'm not using everything I can. So, there, there is that potential. And as you can see on my screen, you can see just how quickly things are melting from sheer shots that are being fired on a target. You know, it's not about overload crits and everything else, it's about sheer number of shots that are being fired per second on top of all the damage boosting, the crit severity, everything else. Now there is some downtime, I didn't even get to activate that power in time, but I noticed that I had another activation of the ultimate set. But it's one of those things, when it's stacked up the right way, you know, y'all saw in the stats, I didn't lose too much on crit chance and crit severity with what I did. I really didn't. Still averaging resting over 40% crit chance and just a little bit more than 200 severity. So it's not like I'm hurting in either of those realms. We're trying to make up for it for the fact of firing cycle haste. Now the one thing I will say, I wish there was a trait that extended duration of EWC. I mean, uh, not EWC, ERL, exceeded grade limits. I think it needs a duration booster, just like Beam Overload got. That way it has 15 seconds of uptime you can have in your constant uptime of it, just like you can have with Fire at Will, Scatter Volley, Rapid Fire, and Overload. I feel that it's, it's worth it. So that's not as much damage as I thought it would do. Let me make for sure this is the right day. Yeah. So, I figured it would do more, but it's understandable that it didn't. Like I said, this is probably going to do better in an ISE. So, I'll post this up. For 4 minutes, 135k. Now, part of this is going to be in this map at least three of my firing cycle haste boosts are target dependent. The Dominion console, the Narendric console, and then also my Focused Frenzy. They're all target dependent. When that target goes away, so does, you know, getting the boost and all that. But it's going to depend on where you're stacking things and all that. But still, 135k, I probably could have gotten more if I had more crit chance, more severity would have played it a little different. And if I look at my parse, let's see here. I've got more attacks for my weapons, and my weapons are still averaging 60 to 70% crit chance on what they're doing. I'm getting putting a damage out of them. It's just, you know, this is not probably the best map to test it. But if I'm doing 135 in elite content with firing cycle haste boosting, I take this into something that's going to actually hold up where I can do alpha strikes on, like those tactical cubes in ISE. They're not going to nuke as fast as some of these targets that were in here on elite content. They're going to last a while. Same with the transformers, same with the gate. I'll be able to stack up a lot more firing cycle haste. Might be able to push this to 175 to 200. And it will never be the best, but clearly it works. Blade, for his part, using this this older ship, he did 59.2k for DPS. And his big claim to fame, 67% of the attacks in. He held threat. I had 32% of the attacks in. But he was holding threat pretty well. So all in all, yeah, it's not it's not the best build, but you can stack for firing cycle haste and still have a good build. Especially if you're doing normal or advanced, you can just stack up all sorts of firing cycle haste and you're fine. Now I know half of this is locked behind like lockbox lockbox consoles or like there's at least one of them's an event, one's part of a set for lobby, some C store stuff there. But still you can find a nice humble medium. And EW and the rate limits is still a good power. It's not going to compete at all with overload, 
but you can still use it and it's still phenomenally used. And I think, quite honestly, the best thing for this, when I was doing my initial testing, would probably be things like sensor-linked weaponry. Just because of how many shots and how many high-powered shots you can do, that's when I was doing the most damage with exceeded rated limits, was your sensor-linked phasers and disruptors. So keep that in mind. All in all, not a bad oddity build, just a build for firing cycle haste. And maybe we can revisit this when we find new ways to combine it and make it better. Until next time, this is Timberwolf and Darkblade, and we are signing off. Alrighty guys, now that we've taken a look at our Beta Thordar and our Chapori runs, let's go ahead and get into our damage breakdown and see how everything did. Now you guys can see here for our Chapori run, it actually lasted four minutes. It's uh, not too common that we get like right on the nose of a four minute mark or a three minute mark or a two minute mark, whatever it is. So I thought that was kind of a little cool thing, I guess round numbers, but uh, you can see here we had just a little over 59k in damage, Timber had a little over 135k, so not our highest damaging tank ever, but it did what we needed it to do, it put some damage out there, it kept the threat, and speaking of threat, let's go ahead and scroll over, you guys can see for our total attacks in, we had 67.41% of the attacks in, meaning we had roughly 67% of the threat, almost 68%. So, it's not our highest threat percentage ever by any means, but it kept the threat. It did what it needed to do. It kept everything off of timber most of the time, which again, no tank is really ever going to have 100% of the threat, unless something crazy is going on. So, yeah, it did what we needed it to do. It kept the threat, so no complaints. Now, moving in, our... Combat Analysis Report. You can see how everything broke down, and what was surprising to me is actually how well the pets performed. You can see our pets were about 18k of our damage that we were doing. Our Crystalline Torp was second at 9.1, almost 9.2k. Then you can see how everything broke down with our two copies of Fire at Will from the Matrices. So, yeah, just kind of trickled down from there, really. Let's go ahead and look at our healing abilities. Give this a moment to load. Alright, so for our healing abilities, again, Energy Refrequencer, our top heal, especially the rank 2 version, gave us 1224.64, or no, 0.63 rather, points of healing per second. So this is again one of those rare cases when it actually out healed everything combined, which was really surprising to me, honestly. You know, I'm used to seeing this really high on the list, if not number one, but I don't think I've quite seen it out heal everything altogether like that for quite some time. So that was surprising to me. But, anyways, that's what we had for our damage breakdown, for our bits of healing overall. You guys can see again, the ship did what we needed it to do as far as generating threat and that sort of thing. Now for the fun part, which is our final thoughts. Now, I have to say for this ship, it actually surprised me and Timber both a little bit. And we discussed some of this stuff off camera as to how well that it did. Now, the one thing, if I had to pick a negative that I would say for this particular ship, what would it be? To me, the potentially negative bit is that I'm having to be a lot more aggressive with this kind of ship than I'm normally used to doing. So, like I say, if I had to pick a negative, that would be the negative that I would attribute to this vessel. But overall, again, it kept the threat. It was able to stay alive. It did what it needed to do. Now, again, it's not our highest damaging tank ever. It's not our highest threat percentage ever. But if you want a carrier, that will get the job done, that will stay alive, that will crank decent damage, that'll let you keep, you know, most of the threat, this is something that you might want to consider. And if you're wondering, can it hold up in today's game? How does it compete? It'll do you fairly well. Now, it's probably not going to be a DPS record breaker. I'm just going to go ahead and float that out there. If you're somebody that likes DPS, if you're trying 
to break records. This is probably not the ship you want to go with. There's other vessels out there that are going to give you far more. But if you're looking for a really nice carrier, maybe you just want to try one of the older ships out just because. Maybe you're a ship collector, a completionist, whatever it is. Maybe there's a low buy sale going on when you see this, or whatever it is, and you're wondering, should I try this out? I personally think it's worth it. I personally think a lot of people, if they give this ship a chance, will be surprised at what it can do. That probably, for some of you out there, may not be your go-to carrier. And maybe it, maybe it will be, for all I know. Maybe you're somebody that likes engineering type carriers. But, if you want a nice ship, if you want something decent for an older vessel, especially a carrier, this one isn't going to do you bad. It's not going to be the record breaker, but it will get the job done. It'll definitely do that. That's something I could say for this ship. I think that a lot of the flack that it gets is rather unfair to the ship just because of the one mission. I don't think that's fair to the obelisk as a whole. Now again, it's not going to be my personal go-to carrier, but for older ships, if you're wanting to try something different, if you're a completionist, definitely give this ship a try. I think you'll be surprised at how well it can actually do in the long run. But for now, folks, this is Captain Blade J52 signing off.